Good. Hi, welcome back. Uh, I heard from uh, some student yesterday that they were still working on uh, homeworks uh, with a uh, ordinal of less than five. You know you're on your fifth homework now, right? And if you're still working on like your first or second homework or something, you're going to be in trouble. So uh, please, please don't do that. Please get caught up. Okay. So uh, we we make it easy for you to lag behind, which is why we force you to actually turn in at least something. Of course, you can turn in an empty file, and we're not going to bother like checking for empty files. But the reason we have the deadlines is to force you to actually do at least some work before you get yourself into a deep big mess. Um, don't get yourself into a deep big mess, please. Uh, you also know that the quizzes are not optional right here. You expect to actually get yeah, to the quizzes. So the vi videos are convenient for those of you who are traveling, you know, job searches and things like that. That's great. Um, but we still expect you to get caught up within about, well, two classes, which is actually four days, which is plenty of time to get caught up. So please, please try to stay current. Last week was meant to be a break so that you can really get current. And hopefully now you're mostly caught up uh, with class, even if you're taking networking at the same time. And uh, we're going to start uh, going at our usual pace again starting today. Okay. All right. We're starting a new topic today. Uh, last week was meant to be uh, sort of cultural material that you need to understand. We're going to rely upon a little bit. Uh, for instance, uh, Ben did uh, representation choices. And we're actually going to exploit those representation choices. Uh, this was actually timed on purpose because starting this week, the material we're going to start doing today is going to rely on a slightly different representation for closures in the programming language. In particular, we're going to find it more convenient. We can actually use Lambda to represent closures. And in class, you talked about some of the trade-offs, right? Some of the issues that come up when you use the same rep the sort of same thing in the source language and in the target language, and why we chose not to do that. But now that we're over that hump and we understand what Lambda is and we understand what state is, we're actually going to use those because otherwise to write all of that stuff out by hand would be, would be kind of like Irish. OK? So um, a topic I want to study today uh, is I'm going to get to it in a kind of roundabout manner. I'm going to get to it by talking about something different, which is writing web programs. Okay. You, you've all written a web program at some point, yes? You've all written server-side programs, client-side programs, server and client-side programs, split server and client-side programs, multiple servers talking to one client, multiple clients talking to one server. I don't know how much of that you've done, but at least I hope you've written a web program at some point. And if not, we're going to write one today. Okay. And I will, uh, there's, there's a reasonable amount of code, all of which is not obviously going to fit on the slides, but it's in the notes. And what I'm going to do is to help you simulate, just sitting in your, in your you know, Dr. Racket editing environment, help you simulate the feel of writing a program for the web. Okay? Let's take the simplest possible program you could imagine, or pretty close to the simplest program. It's kind of, for me, it's like the hello world of web programs. Okay? Uh, before we even talk about the web, let's just talk about writing a program on the console. Okay? So let's, let's follow the tradition of console programming that we've followed since, you know, what, 1960? When did they start having consoles? Right? So, since the machines that are in the computer museum in the CIT, right? since that time <laughs> onward, people have been able to run programs at a console. And let's look at what those programs look like. Um, here's a really simple one. So I'm going to pretend I have a primitive called read, which puts out a prompt and reads in something, or call it you know, input if you want, if that's it. read is maybe, well, read may not be the best chosen name because you've already used to read means something different, I don't want to confuse you. So let's say input, okay? So let's say input takes a string as an argument, it writes out a prompt, and then it reads in a value. You understand how input works? Could you write input? Could you write input? What would input do? Give me the code for input. Do that. Yeah, well, amazing. How about that? I just told you the code. What would it do? It would say begin, display the string, like read an input, and return the thing that you read. Yes? OK? So about two, two lines of code. And let's just assume that input only can return numbers. It checks that what it got is a number, so we know it's a number. It's addition works. So, or we assume that reader actually typed in a number when asked for a number. Okay. Not interested in the type questions here right now, so we'll assume that that stuff's taken care of for us. Okay, you understand input? You understand this program? Will this program work? Is there any gotchas here? 
this, sorry? What is plus two and what is restraint? Oh, well, it doesn't. I mean, I said input returns numbers. Oh. Okay, so input returns numbers. There's, there's no trick question here, okay? This, this is actually gonna work, right? This kind of program has worked since the dawn of time, pretty much. Right? Time, as you know, was invented in about 1961, and since then, <laughs> this program has worked. Um, now, let's say I want to take this program, this legacy program, like uh, Banner, right? What is Banner? It's obviously like a COBOL program from like 1970 that they've just been slapping web interfaces on because they couldn't be bothered to rewrite it to actually work properly. Right? Um, oh God, I'll get sued for this. It doesn't matter, right? I mean, might as well tell the truth. That's what I have. That's what I'm here for. So, uh, input. Uh, let's say we've got this program, this legacy program we've already written and we've been running since 1970 and making money off of. So, hey, we should make a web interface for it. Okay? Then we can charge like a few more million dollars for it. Right? Um, what do we want to do? We want to turn this input rather than just creating a string. We want it to look like awesome. And the way we make it look awesome is we make a web page, right? And we take this string and we put it on the web page. We put a little box there for the actual input value. Okay, and if you want at the bottom, you could say change CRN and things like that. All sorts of wonderful acronyms like that, right? Not that I'm talking about any particular piece of software. But this is what we're going to do, right? We're going to take input and just rewrite the code of input to actually create a web page instead and get the input from the user. And then the rest of the program, so the back office processing part doesn't have to change. Yes? This is a standard sort of refactoring programs, legacy programs for the internet kind of question. But it's also something that you confront on a daily basis in some sense, because you want to write a program that maybe works at the console, or maybe you know it's a Java server program, and you also want it to work seamlessly on the web. right? So things like GWT have to deal with some of these questions. Yes? So, so this is an old problem, it's also a new problem, it should be a familiar problem to you, writing a program that works both at the console kind of interface and on a web interface. Yes? Okay. Does anyone see what's gonna go wrong? This is a wide open question. It's almost a trick question. So I don't expect you to necessarily have an answer, but you should speculate. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. SQL injection attack? Oh, <laughs> oh! So, I actually, last week was at uh, Joe and I were at a sort of invitation only like conference on web security. So I've now learned that the web is even worse than I could possibly have imagined. So yes, we could have a SQL injection attack, of which there are now it turns out like basically four kinds: there are reflected attacks, there are, you know injected attacks, there's server side attacks and client side attacks, and there's cross side request forgery, and there's mimicry attacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those things could go wrong, but we may have a more fundamental problem first. What's the more fundamental problem? I mean, the user could do something that's not a number. Yeah, let's assume that's taken care of for us, right? That's just assume that. So let's keep assuming that. What's even more fundamental? State. State, oh state, oh boy. That's a whole discussion, yeah, hold off on that. Here's something that has probably not, that, so here's a funny thing. Back when I started teaching the material this way in like 2000, this was all kind of new to students. And then there was a period when students were sort of intimately aware of this, and now students have gone back to not being aware of it because you all use frameworks. And frameworks hide these basic facts from you. Okay. Here's the really weird thing about the web. When you send output on a page, right? You, you say generate this page, send the output, right? Which is what input is going to do, right? Input is saying, input is saying, take the string, generate output, and and what? And what? Wait for the user to input something. Wait for the user to input something. Now, what does a program <coughs> on the web server actually do? Does it wait for the user to input something? What does it do? It? it listens for a response on something. Certain. It dies. It dies. Okay. Right here. Uh. <laughs> okay. It's dead. Why does it die? It generates a web page and then dies. Why would it do such a thing? Now, do you think this is what the program wants to do, or do you think this is forced upon the program somehow? Who might be doing forcing this upon the program? Yeah. You 
can't leave a thread open for every request because then you'll get. Analysis. Well, who's forcing this upon the program? Who's forcing this upon? Who's killing the program? The server. Yeah. So the problem is the program doesn't run on its own. There's actually a server sitting down here, right? There's some <coughs> web server. Right, Apache or something like that. And on top of that is the program that you wrote. Right? So this wonderful little addition server that you wrote is running on top of some web server infrastructure. And you're going to say, send out this page, and then the server is going to come along and kill your program. And why does it kill your program? It kills your program because you're mid 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 caught <laughs> your mid bite. Yes. I mean that's that's the spec for HD. That's the spec for HTTP, that's fine, but why did somebody write that? Wait, this is crazy, right? This is the first time in human history since, you know, the start, dawn of time, when programs have not been allowed to, like, actually get input. You've prevented programs from getting input. You've said, if you choose to send a message to the user, you must die. This is, like, the craziest design. Why would you do such a thing? Would you do such a thing? Yeah. It's too expensive to have an arbitrary number of... It's too expensive. It's too expensive. Because what is the alternative? What actually happens in the operating system when you're just sitting at your console, right? You're writing a C program, for example, and you write the moral equivalent of input first, right? So you say, print out this message and wait for input. What actually happens in your operating system? 169ers, yes? There's a thread sitting waiting for an intro. There's a thread sitting waiting for an intro, right? So you have a keyboard intro. When you start typing some characters, that, send, that signals back to this thread. And now when you're finally done, there's some way of the thing knowing that you're done. And now that thread reawakens and sends a message back to the original program. Right? In fact, if you have a single thread program, what's the original program doing during this time? It's just sitting, waiting, right? consuming resources. Now, that seems to be OK on a console, on a desktop application, because how many users are using this program at any given time? Well, I mean, you know, as many people are logged in, and you know exactly who they are. On the web, why does this go wrong? What goes wrong? Why can't you keep a process open? For every single user who connects to your site, why don't you want to keep a process open? That seems like a nice thing to do. Yeah, there's a hundred million of them, right? It doesn't scale. It doesn't scale. It's actually a little worse than that. It's a little worse than that. Because imagine that, so I've, got, I've given this sort of completely ridiculous toy program, right? This addition server. We don't need, actually we have, I'm sure there's lots of addition servers on the internet. We don't really need addition servers, right? What do we really care about? We care about things like, you know, booking hotels, booking flights, things like that, right? So imagine really what's going on is, what it's asking for is what is your first starting destination? What's your final de And then based on that, it produces some output. It says, you know, it, when you go, for example, to say JetBlue, right? You go and you select a starting destination. It immediately filters down all the cities you can fly to from that starting destination. Okay? So that's why there's a two-step process for telling it which cities you want to go, where you're flying between. So input first is basically saying where you want to start from. And then based on that, it filters what places it'll let you fly to presents a set of options and says, now, based on that set of options, input your target destination. And once you've given that, instead of plus, what it's actually doing is computing how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. Right? So the reason I call this like the Hello World program, because it actually simulates what a whole bunch of web applications do. Right? Like flight searches. Now, what happens? You go and you enter your data for the first starting point, and do you, I'm sure you are wonderful people, you always, always, once you start doing a search, you always go all the way to completion and actually buy tickets, right? Right? You would never dream of like just starting a search and then dropping it and going somewhere else. Or would you? So here's the problem. You do this first step, and now there's this thread sitting there waiting eagerly for your second input, and it never comes. So what's the thread supposed to do? Continue running? die, and you've got 100 million. In fact, what you hope dearly is that all of your web services get 100 million users, right? Like, you know, Jonah, what's your, what's your system called? Brown? Uh, best of Brown. Best of Brown, right? There's like 100 million users, I'm sure, by now for Best of Brown, right? Yes? 
close, close. We're on the low side. On the low side of 100 million, yes. Okay, so you know, when you've got 100 million users, how many of these processes are you going to keep open? Each of them costs resources. And most importantly, on the web, you have no idea whether this user is ever going to come back. On a desktop console, you have a pretty good inkling that they're going to come back. And if not, they're going to you know, kill the program or something because they are being hurt. Right? If I start up a whole bunch of processes on this machine, and if I don't kill them, I feel the pain. If I start up a whole bunch of processes on your machine, whoop de doo what do I care? Okay. So the problem is the web is trying to address this issue of statelessness. Okay? This is not a statement about politics, by the way. I know at Brown that's what you immediately think of. But this is a problem about computational state. Okay? It's trying to say that you would like the server to not have the burden of all of these open connections. So how do you avoid the burden of open connections? Well, you just kill the darn program. Once it's dead, you don't have to worry about it. Well, somebody has to worry about something. Where has this burden been put? Who's facing the burden? You, the developer. Right? So when you use frameworks, some of these burdens are hidden from you. But ultimately, you, the developer, are still facing the burden, which is that every time you state perform any output, your program has died and needs to be revived. Right? But ideally, of course, from the user's point of view, they don't want to know that the program died and restarted <laughs> and stuff like that. They, there's how many, how many billion people use the web right now. Right? They don't understand anything about statelessness and stuff like that. They just want it to be the case that when their program revives, it revives and looks as if it was always running. Right? So we want to be able to give them an interface, an API, such that they don't need to, you know, an interface, in particular a user interface, where they don't need to know that the program ever died and resumed, but it looks as if the program always ran. Okay? So what that means is, and by the way, the same thing's going to happen when we perform the second I.O., right? We're going to send out a message. We've resumed the program. We're going to send out a message. Again, the program's going to die because, again, the user may or may not come back. But if the user comes back, we want the program's execution to resume exactly where it started from rather than looking like the program is in some <coughs> state. Right? So it's really helpful if we can think of this as being a collection of little programs rather than one monolithic program. Right? In particular, there's a pattern here that you should recognize as being dangerous. And that pattern is the one we've used all along the semester, which is the idea of a nested computation. Any computation that is nested inside some other computation is in peril. Okay? Because when the program dies, all the existing computation that was waiting for an answer is the part that's going to get nuked off. Okay? So nested computations are bad, which is ironic given that we spent this whole semester making nested computations be good. So let's take this program and let's split it up into two programs. The first program is going to be the stuff that happens until the first I.O. And the second program is going to be all of the rest of the computation, <coughs> the rest of the program. Make sense? Let's split it into two programs. So what is the thing that happens first leading up to the first I.O.? What's the first thing that happens in this program? Is it the plus? Well, the plus is kind of starts running, but it's waiting for something else to happen, right? It's waiting for what to happen? The input, right? So, first thing that's going to happen. And that's the point at which the program is going to die. Right? It's going to send out this page and it's going to die. What is the rest of the computation? What needs to happen if and when the user ever responds to this?
So here's something I used to do in 173. I used to take everybody's name on an index card and call on people at random. I'd shuffle the cards at the beginning of every class and just call on people at random. I could start doing that, believe me, it would wake you up very, very quickly. Anyone? What's the rest of the computation? Yeah. Um, input second. Uh, yeah, go on. Input second. And add the addition, right? So it's, it's, it's like there's a hole in the program, right? There's a hole in the program around everything that we did right now. Now, I'd like to write that as a program. Right? I've only got a programming language. I'd like to write in my program everything that's waiting to happen. So it looks something like this, right? It looks like uh, plus uh, input second. And, and what goes here? It's like, that's, that's the hole, right? That's where the hole is. It looks like that. A little box there saying, that's the thing that has, is going to produce an answer for the rest of the program to work with. That's not a program, right? That, that's, that's, we've got a lot of, what, what is that? That's an unbound identifier whole. How can we make the unbound identifier into a bound identifier? Yeah, even better, lambda. Right? So what have I done? I now have two pieces. The first thing that needs to happen, the thing that needs to happen now, and when it finishes, what's waiting to happen is this piece of code. Okay? Make sense? So I could imagine having a slightly different server, right? That maybe is a little more helpful to me as a programmer. And what I can do is it gives me a special primitive called input. Um, and then, uh, and then what to do? Okay, and input took a string, but input and followed by then takes a second input, and this thing is one of these functions over here. Okay, so it's a function from a number to whatever the computation used to produce. Okay. Previously, if the computation produced a number, it now takes a number and produces a number. If the computation just produced a void, now it takes a number and produces a void. Okay? So this is the representation of the rest of the computation. Okay? So I would use it by saying input slash then. So now I want to do a first, and then the then is going to be lambda whole, okay? And I'm going to, what did I do? I did plus the whole input of second. Okay. Now what is the server going to do? When it gets one of these input thens, it's going to create a little, uh, you know, it's maybe a little hash table, and then the hash table creates a new index into the hash table and stashes this off inside the hash table. <coughs> so this function over here, right? And so now it has a name for that rest of the computation. Okay? Now why does it need a name for the rest of the computation? <coughs> yeah? Well, presumably, it's going to get messages back and some of them are from the first. Instance. That's right. That's right. So this web page over here, right? there's something critical that I haven't shown you on the page, um, which you know, in old days, you had to have an actual button. These days, you don't actually have to have a button because you can use you know, JavaScript to like do the button for you. Right? But you need some way of saying some sort of submit. right? Either you give the user a button to say, now you can decide when to submit, or it can automatically decide to submit based on some pattern on the input, right? Or you do a click and it automatically does a submit, right? But conceptually, there's still a submit action happening. Anyone know how the submit action actually happens? Like, what's the HTML source? What does the HTML source look like for a form? Forms? Yeah? You have to give it a 
submit URL. Yeah, so the source looks like um, this is the critical thing. You have to say action equals. Right there. What goes there? It's a? Uh, submit the URL. It's a URL, right? It's a URL that says when somebody actually performs with some action that corresponds to submission, take all of the content of this form as a bundle and go to that URL and provide it to the thing that's sitting at that URL. And there's two ways to do it, yes? What are the two ways? Get and post, and the difference being? Well, that's where we get to restness. But even sim simpler than that, get is going to stick all the URL, all the field values in the URL, and post is going to send them along sort of more quietly on a, trans on a quiet channel, right? It's going to send it on a back channel, and post get just puts it in the URL itself. And each has its advantages. Get is nicer for, say, bookmarking. Post is nicer because it doesn't stick like you know confidential information in a in a web log that everybody can read. Okay, so there are various trade-offs between get and post. But conceptually, this URL over here is going to receive all the values that were sitting inside the form. Right? So that means we need to be able to provide a URL. We need to provide some URL that says this is where you send all of the stuff. And in particular, whoever's sitting at that URL is ready to receive all of the contents that you send in. Okay? So you could imagine that this string is the thing that actually constitutes that recipient. So this turns into you know HTTP uh, something something slash uh, addition, you know, and something like G twenty seven, right? And now when the server gets G27, it says, oh, I go to my hash table, I pull out this function, and I take the value that was given in the form, which is the content of this box over here, right? And I pass the content of that box over to there, and now the computation can be done. Make sense? OK. Now, are we done converting the program? Is it now safe for the web? Or is there something missing? Do the same thing. I have to do it a second time, right? I have to do this every single time. On every single I.O., I have the danger that I'm going to lose part of the program. So I need to say uh, input slash uh, then. And what is the rest of the computation now? Sorry? Yeah, so I'm going to have a lambda, and this is another box, right? And what am I going to do? I'm going to add. Yeah, uh, I need different names for them, maybe, right? So I need to say box one um, and box two, and add box one and box two. Okay. Yes. Get rid of the okay. Yes. Get rid of what? Well, because input doesn't. Get rid of what? The, the first add. Where? Where? Point. Up, down, left, right. 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 That one. <laughs> yeah. Right there. That one. Why? Because the program died. Input never returns. Yeah. Returned. Because input then never returns. And so this piece of code will never execute. Right? There's just no point to having it there because it's never going to execute. Right? Any nested computation. That was a nested computation. All nested computations are going to die. Right? Anything that was previously nested has to be pushed into the rest of the computation for lambda that you're writing. Yes? What happens if you redesigned your web frameworks that someone could submit a uh, second before they submit it first? Well, in this case, how would they even get to the second before the first? They just can't get to it, right? They have to go through the first to even be given the output that, that lets them generate the do the second. Right. Let's say they had two forms on the same page and they each had a submit button. Ah, OK. Well, so that's different from the scenario that I'm talking about. That's just sort of two parallel inputs, right? Whereas I'm talking about a sequential input where the output, where the, uh, the, the second thing can actually depend on the first, right? That was the airline example I gave you. You click on the starting city, and that determines what target cities you have. And only then do you even get to see the second question. 
Okay. Okay. So that's the scenario I'm talking about. Your scenario would just correspond to a completely different interaction style. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If we have to maintain this hash table. Yeah. Oh, the hash table. Yeah. What about the hash table? Well, the reason that we have the program die every time we do I/O is so that you avoid having space for every request. You avoid having to have space for every request. So what have we done? We've taken something that used to be thread space that was sitting in the memory, and maybe we've turned it into a database state or something like that, right? Okay. These are called sessions. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's a problem. We still haven't achieved statelessness. But it still might be good to move it into the database rather than the OS. It might be better to move it into the database and keeping it sitting on the heap because, you know, database are cheap, and besides, we keep our database group fully employed, which is good for us, um, rather than, you know, memory, which is slightly more expensive than databases, right? Um, so we haven't achieved statelessness, right? We, we're sort of still in sort of, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're sort of faking it, okay? Now, it turns out there's much more I could say about web technology because there's, uh, um, there's actually a way of moving all of this computation onto the client. Because what you've done over here, see this lambda over here, this one over here is kind of a fake lambda, right? It doesn't actually close over anything. But this lambda here really closes over something. It closes over box one. And if it were not a true closure, when you came here to evaluate this addition, it would say, I have no idea what box one is. It's not bounded. That's going to give you an error, which is tantamount to saying, I don't know what origin city you selected for your flight. You wouldn't want that as a user. It'd be like, here's my first city, here's my second city. It's like, oh, what's your first city? It's like, dude, I just told you what it is. Right? You wouldn't want that. But there's turns out that on the web, there's a very convenient place to stash away that value. It's actually two places on the web to stash away the value. That you can store that value on the client rather than storing it on the server. Because if we didn't need to keep the closure around, then it's just the name of a function, and that's trivial. That doesn't cost us anything. We only need it if we have a genuine closure. We just agree, this one's not a genuine closure, but this one is. So if we could take this additional information, the closure information, and store it on the client, we'd be fine. Okay? Well, there's two kinds of places you can store information on a client. Anyone know? Yeah. Uh, cookies or cookies. In fields. Cookies. There we go. There's a good answer. And there's another one, which is a hidden field. Hidden field on the form. What's the difference? Kind of the same thing. In fact, every web framework tells you to use cookies, right? I mean, that's what they do by default, rather than hidden fields. Is there a distinction between cookies and hidden fields? Yeah. I think cookies are stored on the user's computer, and those are sort of page. Yes, that's right. So cookies are stored on the com inside the browser, and hidden fields are stored on the page. But when you send a request, the cookie is sent back, the hidden field is sent back. So they're both sent back. And the page lives on your computer. It doesn't reside on the server. But, but, but a user can like not allow cookies, right? So like yeah, so it's various, uh, various technological questions like do you allow cookies and so forth. So that's, that's, a, that's secondary to program structuring questions, right? So, but what, is there a more fundamental distinction in cookies and hidden fields? With the hidden field, you always have to send that field back to the client. Yeah, so to, to the server, you mean? Oh, the, the, uh, so when you're generating, when the server is generating the web page, okay. uh, there, you know, the, the client has submitted a request and the server sends a hidden field back. Yeah. It has to send you know, whatever value in the hidden field. Yeah. But um, if the client like closes that page or something, a cookie would persist. Ah, so there's but, a persistence problem, right? Which is that the pay hidden field is sitting on the page, the cookie is sort of sitting in the server, it's like ambient state. And so the cookie is sort of written to disk, but you know, assuming that the I mean, if the client closes the page, they close the page. So that's that's a that's a true distinction, but not one relevant to like what is the real semantic difference between cookies and hidden fields. Uh, the cookie can be modified entirely on the client side on the hidden field as well. Well, no, I can modify the client. It's trivial, right? I just open up Firebug and I go and modify my hidden field as well. <laughs> So, yeah, right. I mean, so there's a question of who can modify it. That's still not getting to a semantic difference. Semantic difference. These are all like, these are all like web technology differences, right? What does my browser allow me to edit? And what does it not allow me to edit? But does it actually make a difference from the point of view of the program's correctness whether I use a hidden field or a cookie? Yeah. I think all tabs share the same cookies. <gasps> ah. Sharing. Sharing. 
all tabs share the same set of cookies, right? In fact, that is the whole perniciousness of cookies. I'm logged in on Facebook over here, I go visit New York Times over there, and New York Times, and Facebook suddenly knows what articles I'm reading on New York Times. Why? Because all tabs share the same cookies, right? They are global state, which should sound familiar. They're a mutable store. If this person modifies the cookie over here, that person there notices it. So if I go to Facebook over here and I perform an update, in principle, New York Times can find out about my update. Or if I go to New York Times and view a page, in principle, Facebook can find out about it because they're all sharing the same set of mutable cookies. Okay? This is exactly like the mutable store that we've been studying until now for setbang and setboxbang. Okay? In contrast, hidden fields are hidden fields. They're page-specific. They're not global. Two different pages can have two completely different values in that hidden field. Two different pages are going to have the same value in the cookie. Okay, so that is indeed a semantic difference, but can we observe it? Why don't you observe it? Yeah. Sometimes when you submit a form, the response can come back in a new tab. Uh huh. Which means you might submit something twice. You might submit something twice. That's an interesting idea. So let's talk about the web a little more, shall we? Um, here's time going downward. Okay. So there's a client, which is you, right? and there's a server. And what happens is at some point you go to the server and you say, hey, give me a page. And it comes back and says, here you go, here's your page. And you say, um, I would like to, you know, my first number, which may be my, uh, my starting point of my flight equivalently, is, uh, is this. And the server comes back and says, okay, here's a set of places you can go to. And um, you then say, okay, here is the second flight I would like. And then it comes back and says, okay, here you go, here's your reservation. So far, so good. This is the sequential flow of control. This is an interesting picture because in the uh, 60s and 70s, people spent a lot of time thinking about program execution orderings. Okay? And there was this notorious thing called a go-to statement. You've all heard of go-to's, I hope. Right? Hopefully, you've never used one. Okay? You will use several go-to statements in the next three days. Oh, yeah. Hey, now you're awake. Okay, um, so go-to statements were generally considered a bad thing, but they were also kind of a good thing because they let us do some sort of non-local transfer of control, right? Previously, all you had was like sequential execution. You do this, then you do this, then you do this. Then they said, oh, we'll have function calls. Well, then you would need the stack to remember where to come back to, and then go-to sort of broke out of that box and you can go anywhere you want, and that was considered kind of a bad thing. But then people start to study various other things. They're like core routines and threads and, uh, um, generators and iterators and all these other things, or exceptions and so on, continuations, blah, blah, blah. And pretty much every one of these things was considered valuable and survived in some language or the other, except one thing, which is the coroutine. Like, ah, that one we'll never need. Well, that's the picture of a coroutine. Okay? So coroutine is like a function, except it has the ability to yield control at some point. It starts executing and says, I'm going to suspend now. Okay? And when you invoke it the next time, it resumes where it left off. This is the critical thing. It recovers where it left off, rather than just starting again from the beginning. So if your flight search server said, you know, you go to the first room and say, I'm looking for a flight from Providence. Okay, comes back and says, okay, here are your options. He says, I would like a flight to Paris. And it comes back and says, and where were you flying from again? That's exactly what a function does. It just starts again from the beginning. A coroutine or remembers where you left off and resumes from that point that you left off at. Okay? So this is the classic picture of a coroutine. It used to be in like all the like 1960s operating system textbooks. And then it just sort of got wiped out because clearly we never needed this one idea again. Well, we do. Central to the web. Okay? So we're going to study coroutines and a closely related concept of generators over the next few days. Okay? And then we hopefully we'll have time to even study the relationship to go-to statements. Okay? So this is what's happening on the web. 
in the ordinary and boring case. Okay? Except the web lets us do various other things, right? It lets us, for example, open up things in new tabs. So here's something I can do. I can go to a hotel website, you know, Orbitz, Expedia, Travelocity, whatever, right? And you say, I'd like hotels in the following city. And it comes back and gives you a list of hotels. It says, here's a bunch of hotels. Okay? Here's hotel number one, here's hotel number two, and so on. Right? So now I'm about to do something to break this nice sequential flow of control. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, oh, hotel one, that looks pretty good. I would like to open it in a new tab. You've done this, surely, at some point. You open in a new window or a new tab. Okay? And so it says, here is hotel number one. And you say, well, that looks awesome. That's a really nice hotel. But you know, this other hotel, I don't know if I can afford it, so maybe I'll go look at this other hotel instead. So I've still got this window up on my screen. right? So I go and I say, well, let me explore this one. You look at it, and that looks even better. Except you look at what it costs and say, well, you know, that's fine for people who do security research, but I'm a programming languages researcher. I can't afford hotels like this. <laughs> so I've still got this window up on my screen. So I switch back either to this other tab or this other window. Right? How many tabs do you have open in your browser at a given moment? 40, 50, 30, 5? No, nobody has just one tab on their browser, right? Does anyone here actually have only one tab on their browser? No, exactly. OK, one person. This is a smart web developer, except you're not testing your programs enough. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. I still got this window or tab open on my screen. And I go there, and there's a little reserve button. And I say, yeah, that's the one I want. I click, I make my reservation. Which hotel did I just reserve? OK, let me ask you this. Which hotel did I want to make my reservation at? Hotel number one, we all agree on that. On most web frameworks, you will end up getting your reservation at hotel number two. Why? Cookies. Cookies. Web frameworks push you towards using cookies. Cookies are shared state. They are ambient state. Ambient state is a bad idea unless you really, really want it. So what happens is, when you go and visit this link over here, it sets a cookie saying the hotel you want is hotel number one. When you go here, it sets another cookie. It sets the cookie again saying the hotel you want is hotel number two. The browser has no way of knowing that you've just switched windows over here. And when you click submit over here, it says, which hotel did you want? Well, the latest hotel you saw was hotel number two. That must be where you want the reservation. So the idea that technology we've defaulted to on the web is actually the dumb one. What you want instead is you want to keep this stuff stored with the page. Right? If instead you had a hidden field that said the hotel I want is hotel number one, you click on this link, it generates a hidden field that says the hotel I want is hotel number two. If you go back here and submit over here, it would pass along the hidden field and say you wanted hotel number one, which is exactly where you want the reservation to be made. Okay? This was a notorious problem in like 2001 to 2004. So I think every single website we found we were able to break. And some of them fixed it, and some of them actually, which I will not name, um, I actually gave this talk at a, at a, uh, at a conference once. And uh, an old friend of mine was actually in the audience. It was great. I was like, John, I haven't seen you in years. How are you doing? He's like, Jerome, great to see you again. Um, just so you know, I'm the lead developer for the site whose web shots you have, screenshots you have up there. Like, oh, oops. Uh, we're still friends. Uh, but the next morning, I tried the site again, and now it just gave you an error instead. Which is kind of weird when you think about it, right? It's like an error. You're not allowed to use your browser to explore your program. Like, what sense does that make? So it's complicated. There are reasons for choosing one solution over the other. Let me just point out that sometimes the cookie solution is, in fact, the right one. Okay? Let me give you another site where this is no longer a travel site, but it's a book searching site. Amazon, for example, Barnes and Noble, whatever. Okay? I go here and I get a list of books that I love that from by some particular author. Okay? So I go in and I say, hey, let me explore book number one. Okay? And now let me go in and explore book number two. Okay? I like book number two, so it says add to shopping cart, and I click on it and say add to shopping cart. And now I come back over here and let's say I hit the reload button. Do I expect to see book number two in the shopping cart or not? 
What do you expect? In fact, who cares what you expect? What does Amazon want your shopping cart to contain? <laughs> who wants it to contain? This is pretty much every book you've ever looked at, right? <laughs> so that when you click buy, it's like, you know, one click and there you go, right? So this is a case where you do not want interference between pages. This is a case where you do want interference between pages. So there is, in fact, not a clear you know, rule that says you do want pages to interfere or you don't want pages to interfere. It's a semantic decision about the kind of site you're trying to build. Okay? But the critical thing is for you to think about this question. And I would argue this one's the safe default because it produces the fewest surprises. Right? If you store things in the hidden field, that produces the fewest surprises because you're not going to get like weird interference between pages you didn't expect. But if what you're trying to build is something like a shopping cart where you do want all of these things to end up in the same cart, right? Everybody, you know, if your family goes to the shop, you expect everybody who throws stuff into the shopping cart, you end up buying all of them, right? This is a problem when you have little kids, but anyway. Um, so there, you actually want everything to end up in one cart. And this is a case where you want, you know, I'll call it interference. Okay. So here, in the upper case, hidden fields or a lambda on the server are exactly the right default. In the lower case, a cookie or a correspondingly database state, like a session object, are exactly the right default. Okay? And it's a semantic decision you have to make. So till the web came along, we didn't really have user interfaces that let us explore multiple paths of execution of the same program. Right? Notice what's happened here. The browser has given us user interaction operations, like open a new tab, or open a new window, or clone a page, or reload, that are changing the control flow of the program. Right? The programmer wrote the program with some sort of sequential execution in mind, and the user gets to come along and say, oh, you wrote a sequential program? Well, haha, -ha, I've decided I don't want it to be sequential. Right? This is a really strange thing. It didn't occur before 2000, you know, before like 97, 98. We couldn't do this for a program. Now we can. So a semantic distinction that we could not have observed. There was no way to observe this on a desktop application because on the desktop you don't get to say, hey, I'd like to clone that window. Right? This distinction has now been revealed by browsers and forces us to understand the distinction between the, the threaded store. Right here what's happening is I've threaded the store through all of the computation versus the environment, which is distinct. Every Lambda gets its own environment, but all Lambdas share the same store. Remember? When we did Lambda, we explicitly closed over the environment, but when we did store passing style, we did not close over the store. We explicitly chose to not close over the store, and that's exactly what's happening here. These Lambdas all share the same store, but these Lambdas all have different environments. And if you want that, that distinction, you keep things in the environment. If you want this distinction, you keep things in the store. Make sense? OK, so what have we learned? We've learned that the web has a weird control structure, right? that this control structure comes about because of the desire for statelessness. And it causes programs to sort of terminate upon every output. So anything that needs to get remembered has to be remembered explicitly. A lambda with a hole is a good way to represent this program that needs to get represent, that needs to be remembered, which means, in principle, we could build a server that does the remembering for us, but it'd be even nicer if I could just write this input program, right? If this were the program I wrote, and somebody took care of generating all these lambdas for me, that would be really nice, wouldn't it? OK, that's going to be Freddy's class. Okay. Let me just point out, by the way, if you're used to client-side web programming, there's a similar issue on the client. XHR, XML HTTP request. Again, terminates and forces you to remember everything that needs to come afterwards. Why does it do that? Why does XHR terminate the computation? It's not for statelessness. <coughs> it's don't hang the browser. Why would the browser hang? Because the server. No, because JavaScript is single threaded. And why is JavaScript single threaded? Because it has mutation, and if you throw mutation and threads in, all hell breaks loose. The single best decision Brendan Knight made. But it means you have the same problem on the client end. So, yeah. Good.